Okay, the last few D&D builds I've done on the channel have been a lot of fun, really high on concept and flavor, but arguably a little low on the damage aspect. Nothing wrong with that, but today I'm in the mood to build something that just hits like a truck. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week I do a deep dive into character builds for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, I like to theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way, or even the best way, usually, to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build something that is both powerful, yes, but also really fun to play in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for your role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here, so thank you for watching. My name's Colby. If you enjoy what I do here, I would really appreciate it if you would consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little button down there. You click join. It'll tell you about all the perks you can get for not very much money. You can get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each of these builds to help you recreate the build yourself a little more easily. Access to the D4 community Discord server filled with lots of wonderful, kind, awesome people and even access to the monthly live Q&A hangout sessions that we do. A huge thank you to all of my channel members. You guys are so awesome. I could not do this without you. And everybody else, you are so incredible as well. Thank you for just being here, watching, liking, subscribing, clicking on the notifications bell. These are all great ways to support the channel. So if you don't feel like joining as a member, that's fine. I'm not offended. I appreciate the support that you do give. So one request that I get a lot of on this channel is to do an Echo Knight build. Typically, when those those requests come in, I like to point people to the variety of builds that I have done to date that use the Echo Knight, like the Vengeance Paladin, or the Critlander, or the more recent Flurry of Darkness, to name a few. But I realized recently that I have never, so far as I can recall anyways, done a build that is mostly an Echo Knight. And that seems like a bit of a shame, since one could argue that they are the most powerful fighter subclass in the game, or at least one of the most powerful. This little gem of a subclass comes to us from Matt Mercer and friends over at Critical Role, but make no mistake, though it is wild amount content, do I say that right? Wild amount? I wanna, I wanna say the E. Is it just wild mount? Anyways, while it is Critical Role content, it is also considered to be official D&D material. Unlike, say, the Blood Hunter or like the Gunslinger subclass, also player options, right? Available in D&D Beyond, the Echo Knight, as well as the uh, Chronergy Magic and Graviturgy Magic Wizard subclasses are official D&D 5e content. And as such, a lot more DMs the world over tend to allow them at their tables as opposed to other non-official critical role stuff. Now, I appreciate that not all tables would allow the subclass, whether because they just don't like critical role material in their campaign setting, or even Eberron material, or Ravnica material, or Dragonlance, etc., or because they think the subclass is overpowered. And, you know, there's not much of an argument that I can make against that first reason for disallowing Echo Knights. Uh, sometimes DMs just really want their world to feel cohesive and a little more focused, a little less multiversey, right? Pizza Papa! always gets paid. Whether they've created a homebrew world of their own or are strictly playing like a Faerun Sword Coast kind of campaign. But for those who think the subclass is just plain overpowered, I mean, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. To be fair, I did write this preamble before I had crunched the numbers, um, but I'm gonna stick to it <laughs> for the most part. Uh, sure, getting some extra attacks is really strong, but since those extra attacks are severely limited to constitution modifier number of times per day, right? I do think it is a lot less potent than, say, the extra attacks you get from Gloomstalker, which I have no intention of also using for this build. That would be preposterous. <laughs> and while sure, Echo Knights do get other cool and useful and potent features too that we'll get into, obviously, I don't know that I would argue that this subclass is more powerful than, say, the Hexblade Warlock, at least if we're talking, you know, multi-class dips, or maybe the Bladesinger Wizard, or the aforementioned Gloomstalker, or of course Twilight and Peace Clerics. I mean, 
I might even argue that a straight classed paladin, regardless of their subclass, is at least as if not more powerful than an Echo Knight. I mean, keep in mind that as good as they are, Echo Knights are still fighters, meaning no spells, among other things. I'm not saying fighters are bad. Surely it is my most oft used class if you look at all of my builds as a whole, though more often than not, I'm usually just dipping into fighter, right? Not building mostly fighter characters. And so, yeah, that fact alone that they don't have spells might keep Echo Knights from ever being considered too powerful compared to other classes and subclasses. So, hey, why don't we put the idea to the test? Let's build a mostly Echo Knight and see how their burst damage capabilities stack up to other burst damage builds that I've done so far. Maybe I'll discover that I'm wrong and that the subclass is just way too good. Maybe I will, especially at early levels, but I am willing to find out. And so I proudly present D&D build number 162, the Echo Knight Fighter. But first, a word from our sponsor, Magic Spoon. You know, I really love it when Magic Spoon is the sponsor for the video because it means I get a great excuse to have a delicious bowl of cereal in the middle of my day. And with Magic Spoon, even though today is low carb day, I don't have to worry because not only is cereal delicious, but it has zero grams of sugar, only four to five grams of net carbs per serving, which is crazy low for cereal, and 13 to 14 grams of protein, also amazing. And they have so many fantastic flavors. My favorite, as you probably know by now, is maple waffle, but I also love cocoa, peanut butter, blueberry muffin, fruity, frosted. Uh, this is a new favorite, chocolate chip cookie that I just got. All of these flavors seriously bring me back to when I was a kid watching Saturday morning cartoons. But the nice thing about them is that they have that same kind of nostalgic flavor, but with grown-up ingredients. No artificial flavors, no artificial dyes. I love it. Oh, also, in case you didn't know, they actually have these fantastic cereal bar treats as well. If you need some low-carb, high-protein snacking on the go, one gram of sugar, one to two grams of net carbs, and only 130 calories in each serving. With the same great taste as their cereals, you've got chocolatey peanut butter, blueberry muffin, a bunch of others. So, go check out Magic Spoon. Head over to this link here, magicspoon.com slash d4, or of course you can scan the QR code that's been sitting there the whole time. If you'll do that, they'll know I sent you. And use the code d4 at checkout to save $5 off your order. Oh, and if you're in Canada or the UK, great news, Magic Spoon ships there as well as the US. So huge thanks to Magic Spoon. You guys are awesome, love your products, and let's get back to the build. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he did for this build. He does this every week. If you guys would be interested in following him on social media or reaching out to try and commission him to create some art for your character or maybe your entire party, I will put links in the video description as always on how to do so. All right, at level one, yes, uh, as I so often do, we are going to start fighter today for our starting class, but this time I don't have to feel sheepish about it. <laughs> as for our race, if we're focused on burst damage, like we are, and we're making attacks, especially if it's a lot of attacks, like we will be, and we don't have any setup round getting in the way of our burst damage, which we won't for the most part, then it's almost impossible, I think, not to go bugbear. Seriously, this race is so good. Not so much for the extra reach they get on melee attacks, which is fantastic, and the other nice features they have, like Fey Ancestry, powerful build, and sneaky, but primarily because of the surprise attack feature which tells us that when we hit a creature with an attack roll, they take an extra 2d6 of damage if they haven't taken a turn in combat yet. And no, my friends, there is nothing that would indicate that this only happens once on that opening round. It's every attack we make, so long as the enemy hasn't gone yet. I know. I have a hard time believing it too, but there it is. If your DM wants to nerf this to once on a turn, that's their prerogative, of course, but in that case, I'd probably go a different route for race here, like Variant Human or Custom Lineage for a free feat. And I mean, at that point, you might have to ask your DM, is this really what you want? Another Custom Lineage character from me? <laughs> Nobody wants that. Anyways, as for ability scores, I assume that we go the point by method as always and say, let's take a 15 strength uh, plus one from our racial there, a 14 constitution, a 13 dexterity plus one there, and a 13 wisdom plus one there. Remember, as per more recent D&D &D books, right, every race can decide where to assign their ability score bonuses, and they can either take a plus two and a plus one, or 
three plus ones. We'll do the latter for this build. I mean, Alternatively, we could get up to a 16 constitution and then just do a 13 dexterity and a 13 wisdom, but as important as constitution is, we will need both dexterity and wisdom to be at least at a 13 for multi-classing purposes and will benefit a decent amount from both, you know, if we could get them up to 14, having a plus two in each will be nice, not just for important saving throw purposes, but for initiative and important skill checks as well. I think I'd rather have each of them at plus two than leaving them at plus one so that I could get one more bump to constitution personally, but you do you. As for equipment here, nothing super crazy. I'm gonna say, you know, just take the standard stuff like chain mail. You could either go sword and board, right? Like a D8 weapon and a shield or a big two-hander, your great swords, your mauls. We'll wanna get to that point eventually, but I don't think it's a terrible idea to go sword and board for the first few levels anyways. You know, getting a plus two armor class from a shield is probably worth giving up the two-ish more damage on a hit that we'd get from using a great sword or a maul over like a long sword, right? especially in those early levels when things are pretty dangerous, but either route is probably fine. And yeah, sure, if you wanted to go scale mail instead of chain mail with our plus two bonus to dexterity, the AC is the same either way. Not until we can find plate mail do we really prefer heavy armor on this build. As a fighter one, then, we get second wind first off, which just lets us use a bonus action once per short rest to heal ourselves for a D10 plus our fighter level, always nice. And then we get a fighting style. And yeah, even though we're building for damage on this character and I am planning on using a two-handed heavy weapon eventually. I'm not going to take the great weapon fighting style here as it's pretty crappy, but instead we'll opt for superior technique, which lets us learn one battle master maneuver. Uh, we get a single d6 that resets on a short rest to fuel that maneuver with, and we will be taking for our maneuver, perhaps predictably, a trip attack, which lets us add that d6 in damage on a successful attack and then force an enemy who is large or smaller to make a strength save or be knocked prone. And and of course, we'll have advantage on attacks against prone enemies if we attack them from within five feet. So we really love this to set up a strong round of burst damage early on. At level two, speaking of burst damage, at level two, we get the almighty action surge, letting us, yes, once per short rest, take two actions on our turn instead of one, which for us, of course, will mean more attacks. Lots more attacks. Eventually, lots and lots and lots. Because at level three, we get our fighter subclass, our martial archetype, and yes, of course, we are going with Echo Knight. Echo Knights get some really strong features right here at level three. Their best features, I would argue, and that's why I don't think I've ever taken levels in Echo Knight much past this point, maybe up to extra attack depending on the build, because everything that we need is right here. First up, we get Manifest Echo. This tells us that with a bonus action, we can summon a magical translucent gray image of ourselves. It's not technically a creature and has no stat block to speak of, but it lasts until we dismiss it or is killed, or we become incapacitated, or we end our turn 30 feet away from it, right? It's pretty dang squishy. It only has an AC of 14 plus our proficiency bonus with one single hit point, though it is immune to all conditions and uses our saving throw bonus for its saves. Importantly, and people in the comments always seem to forget this, even if it dies, we can just summon it again with a bonus action. There's no limit given on how often we can do this, and there's no reason we couldn't just summon it at the beginning of the day right when we wake up and then have it available to us when combat begins, since it doesn't expire after a set amount of time or anything. Now, we're told that when we take the attack action on our turn, any attack that we make can originate from either our space or the Echo's space, and we choose for each attack. That's really cool and can potentially lead to some fun ping-ponging shenanigans if we have a nice way to do forced movement especially, right? Yes, I've got that on my to-do list. I think I'll make a Ghost Lance build one day, but also, when a creature moves away from our echo, we can make an opportunity attack as though they were moving away from us. Potentially really useful. And then finally, as a bonus action, we can magically swap places with our echo at the cost of 15 feet of move speed, regardless of the distance between us. That's especially potent when we remember that though the echo is destroyed if it's ever more than 30 feet away from us at the end of our turn, like I said, we can move them up to 30 feet on our turn with no action required by us, meaning we could, for example, move them from 30 feet away from us if they were starting out at 30 feet away right move them 30 more to be 60 feet away then teleport switch places with them after which they'd be destroyed yes because they couldn't get back into the 30 foot range of us right but 
we can just resummon them with a bonus action, it's not a big deal. Or yeah, I mean, if they start 30 feet away from us, move them 15, teleport, you know, 45 feet away, and then move them 15 feet to get closer to you, keeping them from getting poofed. Anyways, some fun utility and potential combat tactics to play with here, no question. The feature we care about most, of course, for the sake of numbers anyways, is Unleash Incarnation. This tells us that whenever we take the attack action, we can make one additional attack from the Echo's position. Now, we can only do this constantly Constitution modifier times per day, so twice for us right now, but it does say that we can do this whenever we take the attack action. Keep in mind that if we take the attack action, then action surge, then take the attack action again, we are taking the attack action twice, right? We could potentially then get two more attacks out of this feature on one single turn, at least once per day. Anyways, that'll be really great for those of us who say are adding 2d6 damage to every attack we make on the first round of combat, for example, as well as other things that we'll be doing later to add damage to every single attack, right? Speaking of which, at level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and we are going, if you can believe it, with Great Weapon Master. <laughs> Shocker, I know. Ah, <sighs> This feat is so good. I am going to miss it when the new Player's Handbook comes out later this year, but to be fair, weapon users are getting lots of other nice buffs, so it's probably a blessing in disguise that this feat is getting nerfed to keep us from feeling like we always have to be taking it or sharpshooter on like weapon user builds, right? Anyways, for now, it tells us that when we make an attack with a heavy weapon, not just when we make an attack with two hands on a weapon, like in Baldur's Gate 3, take a drink, uh, that allows for versatile weapons to potentially take advantage of this feat, right? And would, in D&D anyways, where the weapon exists, allow us to use Great Weapon Master with double-bladed scimitar. I wish they would make that change for D&D, alas. Anyways, when we make an attack with a heavy weapon, we can take a minus five penalty to hit in order to do 10 more flat damage. Chevere. Also, don't forget, as I so often do, that if we get a critical hit or kill an enemy, we can make a melee weapon attack as a bonus action. Awesome. How often is that going to happen? I have no idea. Depends on your table, depends on your campaign, what you're fighting, etc, etc. But I think it'll happen fairly regularly, based on experience, I guess, anyways. And yes, of course, if you have been going sword and board up until this point, at this level, we want to switch to a two-handed weapon. So, you know, the great sword or the maul is technically best numbers-wise for that 2d6 weapon damage. A great axe is fine though too, d12 is not a big difference. And now adding 10 to each time we hit. At level 5, we get extra attack so that now when we take the attack action, we can attack twice, and if we have a charge of unleash incarnation to burn, three times. And if we have action surge, yeah, that's six attacks in a single round at level 5. 7 if we crit or kill something, which we almost assuredly will, right? Uh, thanks to the bonus action attack from Great Weapon Master. That's a lot of attacks. Um, at level 6, we get yet another ability score increase or feat. I love fighters for this. And, you know, you may be thinking that I'm going to take Polearm Master here, but you'd be wrong, actually. I do love the feat. Getting a bonus action attack with the blunt end of the weapon is really great, but before too long, we are going to have something else to do with our bonus action that's actually going to be better, at least for our Nova round numbers, than even a butt action attack would be, right? Believe it or not. And, I mean, yeah, the likelihood of us getting a kill or a crit, at least during our Nova round, is really pretty dang high, to the point that I'd just as soon not worry about taking the Polearm Master feat, stick to our Greatsword or Maul here, and just bump our strength with our ability score increase at this level, so that we can increase our hit chance and our damage when we hit, which will be really nice. Not to mention the DC of our trip attack, right? Keep in mind, that uses our strength, or dexterity, strength for us, and yeah, tripping our opponent during our Nova round is going to be really important. All right. At level 6, it is time for our first damage report! A combat for us at this level is pretty straightforward. We pretty much just hit stuff. A lot. So yes, I'm assuming that we've got our echo out and on the first round of combat we're going to want to just run up to our target, move our echo up to our target as well, attack them three times, burning a charge of our unleashed incarnation, right? Then action surge, 
rinse, repeat. On the first attack that hits, of course, we're going to want to apply our trip attack and try to knock them prone so that we'd have advantage for the rest of our attacks that round. I'm going to assume, this is going to upset some of you, mostly for the ease of number crunching that we have advantage on our attacks, at least all of the attacks after the first. I know it's not 100% chance that that will be the case. In the name of exploring best case scenario numbers, right, damage wise, and in the name of keeping the math relatively simple for myself, and because this is kind of what I've done on other builds that use trip attack, right? And I want to kind of compare apples to apples here. That's the assumption I'm going to make. Know that the numbers are slightly inflated for that reason. As for whether or not we'll get a bonus action attack, thanks to Great Weapon Master, let's assume that we're going to get one 50% of the time. Honestly, that feels a little low to me, but maybe that's fine since we're assuming that we've got advantage after the first attacks and we could use something to kind of reel the numbers in, right? So six attacks with a 2d6 weapon, adding 2d6 more, thanks to bugbear surprise attack, plus 1d6 on one of those, thanks to our superiority die, plus four from our strength, and 10 from great weapon master to each attack means a total of 25 d6 plus 84 damage with a 50 percent chance for that to be 29 d6 plus 98 holy crap and so against an enemy with a 10 armor class here we would on average do 164 damage during our burst round nova round and against an enemy with a 15 armor class it would be 121 damage on average what the crap <laughs> flip table <laughs> And compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely destroying everything else that I've ever done by like 50%. <laughs> Did I say Echo Knights weren't OP? Okay, now hold on, just hold on, everyone, sit down, because Yes, there are a ton of things that we have to consider with these numbers here. Lots of grains of salt to be ingested. First off, yeah, I shouldn't be assuming that we've got advantage. I mean, the creature you're attacking might not be large or smaller, in which case, no trip. You might miss that first attack and then, of course, not have tripped them, or the second or third attacks even, for that matter. Or they might just make their saving throw against it. I should probably just assume that we've only got advantage like 50% of the time or something. Like I said, Say the biggest problem here is that if I want to compare this to other builds that I've done in the past, yeah, I kind of just assume that the enemy is prone in these scenarios, and I'd rather try my best to compare apples to apples than anything. But honestly, even if we never had advantage on any of our attacks, we would still be beating out any other build that I've done to date for burst damage at this level. In that case, it would be just by a little bit, but yeah, so it's unquestionably still very powerful. But these numbers are also something that we could only potentially achieve once per day, right? So the more combat encounters you have between long rests, the less impressive this damage becomes. Uh, sure, you can action surge and trip attack per short rest but in that scenario the numbers are a lot less crazy and don't forget a ton of our damage is coming from the bugbear's surprise attack feature what if we can't get into range of an enemy who hasn't gone in combat on round one so much for like a quarter of our damage and we only have a plus two to our initiative rolls at the moment we might very well be taking our turn after all the enemies have already gone anyways oh and note we basically don't want to be using great weapon master on that very first attack it's so important to hit to try and get them knocked prone right and on the rest of the attacks that we get that round if they are prone, we're still turning off Great Weapon Master at an enemy AC of 17 or higher. Not all that high, right? And if they're not prone, we don't want to use it above an enemy AC of 15 even. So yeah, this is one of those things where it's like, if everything works and once per day, we are out of this world insane damage wise. But when it doesn't work and or during the rest of our combat encounters, we're strong, but not ridiculous. But yeah. I mean, it's gonna be a lot of fun when we get to be ridiculous. <laughs> Let's see just how much more ridiculous we can make it, shall we? So, at level seven, now that we have our most important early features from Fighter, I think it's time to do some multiclassing. In particular, we want to find ways to get more attacks on that opening round, since that's when we're going Nova, and perhaps unsurprisingly for some of you, I think the best place to go for that is, yes, Ranger. So our Echo Knight, Ghost, and Shade 
raid focused fighter has now for some reason decided to develop their tracking and survival skills why maybe it's been part of your backstory all along maybe it's not too far a stretch for a character who's attuned to the shades of their own might as a cycling swarm of shadows and strikes like we're told in the you know flavor text uh, that describes the subclass uh, maybe that kind of character leaning into that shadow and gloom aspect of who they are isn't too far a stretch and kind of makes an easy link up for this multi-class anyways as a Ranger 1, we get the Deft Explorer feature, uh, Canny, right? Which gives us expertise basically in a skill of our choice that we're proficient in. I think I'd probably take Perception here, maybe Athletics, but pick your favorite. And then we get Favored Foe, which lets us proficiency bonus times per day. And with our concentration, unfortunately, mark a target so that we do an extra d4 of damage to them the first time we hit them with an attack on our turn. Not bad if we're not doing anything else with our concentration, but we will be doing that shortly because at level eight, we would be a ranger two, and that means we get ranger spells. And while there are plenty of decent utility and support options to consider here, the one we really wanna make sure to grab is, yes, the quintessential hunter's mark. Now, this spell is rarely a great spell, and often times not even very good, arguably. But in the right circumstances, like when you're making a boatload of attacks and don't necessarily have a guaranteed bonus action attack anyways, it's pretty dang fantastic. It's cast as a bonus action, requires concentration, and then simply does an extra d6 of damage to our marked target anytime we hit them with a weapon attack. And for us, that's going to convert to a whole lot of d6s, during our Nova round especially. And yeah, you can transfer it to another target when the first one dies with the bonus action, right, on subsequent turns. We also get another fighting style here at Ranger 2, and of all the options available to Rangers, I think I'd probably take either defense to increase our AC by one, or maybe blind fighting so that we can essentially have blind sight out to a range of 10 feet. Really nice to have when you need it. I mean, tell your warlock friend to go ahead and cast darkness if they've got it right? It's not going to bother you anyways. At level 9, we would be a ranger 3, and that means we get our ranger archetype, our subclass, and we, of course, are going with Gloomstalker, which is really just so dang strong and pairs so incredibly well with this character here. It felt almost impossible to not do this. And I think it's got some nice conceptual synergies as well. Gloomstalkers get two really strong features here right off the bat similar to Echo Knights, right? First up, Dread Ambusher gives us a bonus to our initiative equal to our Wisdom modifier, which makes me really glad that I went 14 Dex and 14 Wisdom back at level one, giving us a pretty respectable plus four to our initiative now, which feels a lot better to me. We also get an extra 10 feet of move speed on the first round of combat, wonderful, and above all, if we take the attack action during the first round of combat, we get to make an extra attack that deals an extra D8 of damage if it hits. Importantly, the wording here is similar to our Unleash Incarnation feature in that the extra attack is triggered when we take the attack action, meaning that if we action surge and take the attack action twice during that first round, then yes, we will get an extra attack from Dread Ambusher both times. So this has taken our opening round from six attacks to eight, with two of them getting an extra d8 of damage now. Sheesh. But I think Umbral Sight might actually be my favorite feature to pair with this build. Dread Ambusher is better for the numbers, of course, right? But Umbral Sight is just flavorful and so cool. It increases our dark vision that we already had by 30 feet, nice, but then tells us that if we're in the dark and a creature relies on dark vision to see us, we are invisible to them. A lot of enemies in D&D have dark vision, and there are a lot of scenarios where there might be a patch of darkness somewhere on the battlefield. I mean, darkness is good for any Gloomstalker, but for us, with our ability to make attacks from our Echo's location, it's way better. Because keep in mind that when we make an attack from our Echo's location, even though the attack is originating from the Echo's location, we are still the ones making the attack, right? So. Let's say, for example, that we've got an enemy standing in like dim light or bright light, but there's maybe a patch of darkness 20 or 30 feet away from them, like outside of the range of the torchlight or something. Well, 
If we put ourselves in that darkness and move our echo up next to the enemy, that enemy is not going to be able to see us even if they have dark vision. And so the attacks we make, even if made from our echo's location, will be made with advantage. That might feel a little counterintuitive, and I can see some DMs not wanting to rule that way, but rules as written, that's how it should work. The echo isn't the one making the attack. We are from their location, right? And we are invisible to the enemy. As always, go over things with your DM beforehand to make sure that you're on the same page as to how these mechanics work. And I mean, I was already assuming, perhaps faultily, that we had advantage on most of our attacks at least, so this doesn't really change things for number crunching purposes, but it at least makes me feel a little bit better about assuming advantage since I think it'll be even more likely to happen now, depending on the battlefield, of course. Speaking of number crunching, at level nine, it is time for our next damage report. Since last check, we have gotten rid of that 50% chance at a bonus action attack, but have added a d6 to all of our other attacks thanks to Hunter's Mark, and also added two more attacks during our Nova round that each get an extra d8 of damage if they hit, to boot. We've even picked up a little bit of utility and support capabilities thanks to our rangerness. But at this level, with 8 attacks during our Nova round against enemies with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 253 damage on average, and against an enemy with a 16 AC, it would be 189 damage. And compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date, at this level, that's actually not just blowing everything else out of the water, believe it or not. It still has a slight edge at those really low enemy armor classes, but once you get up to even like middling AC and higher, it starts to fall below some of the other builds, which I'm actually kind of relieved to see if I'm being honest. And it actually brings up an important consideration here. As great as Great Weapon Master is, there's this kind of funny thing about it where the more ways we have to add damage to each attack, the sort of worse Great Weapon Master becomes. Because while, sure, a flat 10 damage on a hit is great, if we're adding 2d6 from Bugbear and a d6 from Hunter's Mark and a d8 on our Dread Ambusher attacks, plus our Strength modifiers, etc., etc., then that 10 flat damage becomes less and less of the total damage that we're doing. And with the very painful minus 5 to hit that it brings, we're better off not even using it at this level against like an enemy AC of 18 or higher. And at level 9, an enemy AC of 18 might be just considered kind of average or maybe even below average depending on your table and your campaign, right? Of course, that 18 changes if we have a magic weapon increasing our hit chance and like an ally casting bless on us, etc. Then again, if the enemy's not prone and we don't otherwise have advantage, then it's even lower than 18. So just keep this in mind, right? If you play at a table where your DM tends to throw some pretty difficult encounters your way on the regular with enemies that are decently hard to hit, you might want to skip the Great Weapon Master feat altogether on this build and just beeline to a 20 strength or other feats, which we'll talk about later. That said, things change outside of our Nova round, right? Once we're not getting that extra 2d6 from surprise attack especially, then the 10 flat damage from Great Weapon Master becomes a lot more valuable by comparison, and so for sustained damage purposes after round one, you might want to have Great Weapon Master after all. Just things to consider when you're building your character. Build it for your table, understanding what things are likely going to look like in-game once you get this character outside of the lab, right? All right. At level 10, I'm going to say let's take just one more level of ranger here that would make us a ranger 4 because there's that ability score increase or feat just right there and I'd love to cap my strength score, taking it to 20. Again, not only because it increases our hit chance and the damage on a hit, but the DC of our trip attack. Now, I will say, some of you like to give me grief, and rightly so, about constantly ignoring the alert feat on my builds, which is really strong. It adds 5 to our initiative roll and keeps us from being surprised to boot. And yet, yeah, there's almost nothing more important than winning initiative with this character for burst damage purposes. So I think you could absolutely make the argument that alert should be taken even before Great Weapon Master, honestly. It just doesn't really do anything for the numbers on the spreadsheets, which I am beholden to after all. So that's kind of why you always see me chasing the numbers and ignoring things like alert. But by all means, feel free to take the alert feat at some point along the way here, maybe even right off the bat. It's not a bad idea at all. If I were playing this character in game, I just might do it. If not at level 4, maybe at level 6, I don't know. Anyways, at level 11, yes, of course, I want to get back to fighter because at fighter 11 we get that sweet, sweet third attack with the attack action, right? I know, it's incredible, 
And yet, it is five long levels away from where we are right now. And between here and there, there's a bit of a dearth of features for fighters, at least for damage purposes. Were I playing this character in game, I might just suck it up at this point and get back to fighter. Take my medicine and hold out for fighter 11. At least if I knew that the campaign was gonna go beyond level like 13, 14, 15, right? But there is something we could do fairly easily right now instead to give ourselves another nice little damage bump if we really wanted to. Maybe especially if we knew that our campaign was going to end at around level 13. And that would be to take a little druid detour here. It's not perfect, it's not without its drawbacks, but let's pretend that our foray into the gloomy side of the natural world with our gloomstalker levels got our character even more interested in the things that grow in the dark places, motivating us to, for a time, abandon our martial pursuits in favor of a desire to further increase our magical primal abilities, especially around death and decay. As a druid one then, we learn druidic, which is the special language that druids know so that they can leave messages for each other in the woods with twigs and leaves and things, and then we get druid spells. And sure, good berry, healing word, guidance, entangle, maybe fog cloud if we didn't already have it, especially if we took blind fighting, right? Uh, and more spells are all worth considering, but I'm just gonna say PYF here, pick your favorite, as nothing that's available to us is gonna do anything to increase our burst damage capability. Abilities. But at level 12, we would be a druid 2, and, and this is where we get what we came for. Uh, first up, we get wild shape. All druids get wild shape, letting us transform into a beast of challenge rating one quarter or lower, twice per short rest, and that provides some great utility, but I'm not going to spend much time talking about it because we have other uses for our wild shape charges since we also get our druidic circle here, our druid subclass, right? And yes, I think we ought to go with the circle of spores because as a spores druid, we get Halo of Spores. Actually, that's not the reason. Uh, Halo of Spores is pretty crappy. It lets us use our reaction to do, uh, well, a little bit of necrotic damage to an enemy within 10 feet of us if they fail a constitution saving throw. And that's just so bad that I don't even think I'll add it into my damage calculations. I would rather hold on to my reaction in case I can get an opportunity attack, especially since, as an Echo Knight, I can make an opportunity attack if they move away from me or from my Echo's location, right? No, the real reason that we're here is for Symbiotic Entity, of course, which lets us use a Wild Shape charge to grant us four temporary hit points per Druid level, so eight. And then while we have at least one of those temporary hit points, do an extra D6 of damage on all of our melee weapon attacks. Now, an extra D6 of damage is nice, but there are several drawbacks here. First off, as we said, we only get the damage so long as we've got those temporary hit points, right? They're not gonna last very long. But that's kind of the least of my concerns with this ability for this build, since we are building for Nova damage. I primarily just really want them on round one. Anything I get out of them after that is just gravy. And you know, temporary hit points are temporary hit points, always handy. The bigger concerns are that it takes an action to get Symbiotic Entity going, and that the ability only lasts 10 minutes unlike in BG3 where it lasts all day. So much better. Take a drink. Was this ability really worth a two level detour? Uh, you decide. If you think you will semi-reliably be able to get symbiotic entity going before combat breaks out, whether because you've got a great scout in your party who often gives a heads up about an encounter just around the corner that you can then prepare for, right? Or because you might be able to throw a buff on yourself during a villain's monologue, then sure, an extra D6 of damage on eight attacks is fantastic. And the extra hit points and additional utility and support options from Druid are an okay bonus. On the other hand, if reliably being able to buff yourself in this way before a combat encounter happens is rarely going to fly at your table, no worries. I'd probably skip Druid and just go back to Fighter. But hey, a 10 minute duration is a lot better than a one minute duration, so I do think most of us could get this going somewhat reliably, making the Druid dip at least worth considering. I'll assume that we've got it going when I crunch numbers going forward. Another nice little cherry on top reason for taking Druid, though, is that it lets us get the Wild Companion feature, which lets us use a Wild Shape charge to cast the Find Familiar spell, right? And that means we could summon a little owl. It unfortunately only lasts two hours for us, but this familiar could then grant us advantage on our first attack and up until now I've been assuming that we didn't have advantage on that all-important first attack we were making to try and trip our target so now I feel like 
I can sleep a little better at night, safe perhaps in my naive assumption that all of our attacks now can be made with advantage. <sighs> Ignorance is bliss. But at level 13, all right, fine. Let's go back to fighter so we can eventually, at least, get that sweet, sweet extra, extra attack. That means we would be a fighter seven now, and as an Echo Knight, that gives us the Echo Avatar feature. Pretty sure this is the first time I've ever gotten this feature on a character build before. It's not bad utility. It basically lets us like warg into our Echo, similar to what we can do with a familiar, which we already have, admittedly, but this lets us see and hear through the Echo's location. Here, this ability lasts for up to 10 minutes, and we can move the echo and see and hear through their senses when the echo is up to a thousand feet away from us without the echo being destroyed. This provides for some pretty interesting utility. We can swap places with our echo no matter how far away from us they are, right? I don't know why we couldn't move them all the way up to a thousand feet away like this and then swap places with them. Now, sure, the echo would be destroyed at the end of our turn since it couldn't get back to within 30 feet of us, right? But Again, we can just summon it back with a bonus action. This could provide for some fun utility, helping us get into otherwise really hard to reach places, maybe even get surprise on our enemy. Anyways, let me know about some fun ways that you have seen the echo used, aside from just the, like, I hit stuff more often feature, right? I'm sure several of you have some really great stories. At level 13 though, it is time for our next damage report. Since last check, we have capped our strength modifier and added yet another d6 to all of our attacks, potentially thanks to symbiotic entity. I'm also going to assume that we've got advantage on all of our attacks now, like I've said, faulty though that assumption may be. Finally, yeah, we've picked up a bit more survivability and utility and support options, which are always great to have. But here, against enemies with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 305 damage during our Nova round, and against a 17 AC, it would be 200. And 30. Whew. We broke the 300 mark against low enemy armor classes anyways, but compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date at this level, that puts us kind of in like the middle of tier one now. Why have we not scaled quite as well as some of those other builds? The easy answer is spells. Uh, spells and or smites. When we have spells with solid scaling damage or smites that scale really well, it is difficult to keep up damage wise when we're just bringing like a non-scaling hunter's mark to the party. I actually thought of trying to get paladin levels on this build, but if you're going ranger, needing a 13 dex and wisdom, you just can't really mix with a paladin who needs a 13 strength and charisma, right? If you wanted to dump constitution, sure, but if we did that, then we couldn't take advantage of Unleash Incarnation, so why are we an Echo Knight, right? And yeah, I, I actually crunched the numbers, comparing uh, Gloomstalker to Paladin, and realized that at least up through this point in the character's career, we get a lot more out of our Nova round from those dread ambusher Gloomstalker attacks and Hunter's Mark than we would out of a few smites. And most campaigns end by this point in the game anyway, so it just, yeah, felt like the better choice. I mean, regardless, it's not like we're just limping along here or anything. I mean, mid-tier one is still amazing damage, and we've been cream of the crop up until this point, so nothing to be feeling bad about not by a long shot. At level 14, we would be a fighter eight. That means we get another ability score increase or feat. And sure, if you haven't taken it yet, I'd grab alert for reasons that we've already mentioned. You could always consider instead bumping like wisdom or dexterity for both defensive purposes and also to increase our initiative. But I think alert is our best bet here. That said, bumping constitution wouldn't be a terrible move either, both for defensive and concentration purposes, but also to give us one more use of unleash incarnation per day for a little more on-demand burst damage, right? I mean, I should also mention, I suppose, that while we have decided against it for burst damage purposes, uh, Polar Master is a nice feat to have for sustained damage, and though I kind of think that burst damage is like the king and queen of combat in D&D 5e most of the time. Sustained damage is both important and powerful too, obviously. So yeah, you might want to grab Polar Master here to get a more reliable bonus action attack outside of your Nova round, especially if you come across a really great Glaive or Halberd. And you know, for that reason, you might have wanted to do that before trying to cap your strength score. At level 15, we would be a fighter nine, and that means we get Indomitable, my least favorite fighter ability. <laughs> it tells us that once per day you can reroll a saving throw that you fail. Hmm, maybe we should have taken Resilient Wisdom last level instead with that feat, right? Because, yeah, I mean, the problem with Indomitable, 
you're fairly likely to fail that save when you re-roll it if it's anything other than a strength or constitution save, honestly. Now, if you're watching this video after the new player's handbook comes out uh, later in 2024, congratulations. It looks like Indomitable is getting some very nice buffs, so you are not quite so sad about this feature. At level 16, we would be a Fighter 10, and that means as an Echo Knight we get Shadow Martyr. This is a nice little protection support focused feature, letting you sacrifice your Echo, throwing them in front of an attack directed at another creature and taking the hit for them. This hit will almost assuredly kill the Echo, but that's usually a lot better than having one of your ally PCs take the hit, so good job. Uh, bring your Echo back next turn with a bonus action. Alas, you can only be a Martyr like this once per short rest, but it's not a bad little feature. But then finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a fighter 11, meaning that yes, we finally get that vaunted extra extra attack. So now, during our Nova round, we'll get, uh, yeah, 10 Great Weapon Master Surprise Attack Hunter's Mark Symbiotic Entity and Strength Infused Attacks. Hooray! Oh, and of course, on all of our non-Nova rounds, having 50% more attacks is incredible. And maybe we should have skipped those druid levels after all. <laughs> but no, sustained damage be damned. We're here for burst and burst we shall for our level 17 damage report. Since last check, we've added two more attacks to the mix and otherwise picked up some nice support and defensive features. And so, against enemies, with a 10 armor class, we would here on average do 383 damage during our Nova round, and against an 18 AC, it would be 282 damage. Almost broke that 400 mark. Would have been sweet, but compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date, at this level, we're kind of like more near the bottom of tier one, actually, despite getting those two more attacks even. Again, we just haven't scaled quite as well as those casters and smiters, right? Not like we're feeling the pain of our abysmal damage or anything like that. So, yeah, let's um, let's wrap it up here with some final thoughts. The tier score for this build, if you take the damage that they do at each of the armor classes that we calculate for at each of the four damage reports and just average them all into one big number, we end up with a 198, which puts us, not surprisingly if you've been paying attention, like right in the middle of the pack for tier one. An incredible place to be. And yeah, importantly, I think we're at the top or very near the top for those first 10 levels or so where most most of us are actually playing the game, making this build unquestionably among the elite of burst damage builds to date, from a pure numbers perspective at least. But yes, like I emphasized early on, let's kind of keep our expectations in check a little bit here, shall we? There are going to be times where you will just feel godlike with this build, I think. You're gonna get a good initiative roll, make that trip, or maybe someone else in your party might be doing something else to give you advantage or boost your hit chance, and you're going to just land every single one of those incredibly hard-hitting attacks on your opening round, and in all likelihood kill multiple enemies before the end of your first turn, or put a massive dent in a boss, etc. But also, if we're being real, sure, there are going to be times where you whiff that trip attack or they make their saving throw and then you decide not to use Great Weapon Master because they've got a decent armor class and you're going to roll poorly and maybe only land a couple of hits and feel really underwhelmed. But hey, I mean, yeah, this is D&D, right? The dice are the dice. I don't mind building something that's amazing sometimes and just kind of okay other times because my goodness, when everything lands, yeah, everyone at the table is going to have their jaw on the floor and be cheering you on to glory. Everyone except the DM, maybe. <laughs> Final analysis, is the Echo Knight OP? Admittedly, I am a little more willing to consider that argument now than I was when I wrote the preamble. It's undoubtedly very, very good. Arguably still the strongest fighter subclass, but I don't think even that statement is just like undeniable or anything. Battlemasters, Rune Knights, and Eldritch Knights could all make an argument for being the best, I think, depending on how you were building your character, what you were looking for out of your character. Psy Knights and Samurais and even Arcane Archers, imperfect as they are, definitely can be really strong with the right build, as I think we've shown on this channel. Even Cavaliers are great if you're looking for a tank, especially if your mount is one of your fellow players. As for Champions and Purple Dragon Knights, yeah, sorry guys, you're kind of poopy. <laughs> but anyways, yes, Echo Knights are definitely potent. OP, maybe. 
depending on your table. But really powerful and a whole lot of fun to play, unquestionably. So I certainly hope that you get to play them someday if you haven't had the chance to do so yet. But that's the build for the week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that you know how much I love you because I do. Thank you for all that you do for me, for the channel. You guys are so awesome. I hope you have a really fantastic day and a great week. And if you don't, please hang in there. You got this. I hope that you do good and that you be kind and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Bye. May your heart keep close. May your heart hold high. Louder, louder than the echo. Brighter, brighter than the shadow. Oh, you are, oh, you are, who? <laughs> that song, uh, The Echo and the Shadow. I mean, how could I not sing that song for this episode? It's by uh, the Well Pennies. They are a, like a little known kind of indie folk pop duo. I think they're out of Iowa. They're so good, though. They just, their music is among the happiest known to mankind. If you could use a little more, uh, you know, happiness in your life, and who couldn't, right? Check out the Well Pennies. They are, they are awesome. Gorgeous music. Man, I am intrigued by the interaction of my little, my little light and like the way it looks in person versus the way it looks on camera. It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a greenish yellow when I look at it with my eyeballs. And it's kind of a, like a yellow orange. I don't know. The paint, the coloring of the light, it all just kind of messes with it. Oh, also, in case you hadn't seen, you guys, like Brandon Sanderson, right? You know he's one of my favorite authors. He just released um, his uh, Kickstarter for uh, the volume two of the Stormlight Archive, right? Um, my favorite of the books, uh, Words of Radiance, uh, the Leatherbound Kickstarter for it, which I backed and is going to be so awesome. This is the first, um, this is the first book, or at least volume two of the first book. Check out Dalinar. <laughs> He's so awesome. That's, that's, same, same guy. Yeah, the art, the extra art that they have in here is just so phenomenal. Um, ooh, look at Shalon and uh, Yasna, my crush. Anyway, just lots of like extra art in the in the book itself too. Um, oh, look at one of the uh, one of the singers. Yeah, kind of a gold embossed. Anyways, beautiful, and I'm sure that. Volume 2, that Words of Radiance is going to be just as incredible. So yeah, if you're a fan, highly recommend uh, backing backing that. Oh, not on Kickstarter, right? It's on Backer Kit. Interesting. So hard not to focus on Shepard because she is so awesome. Mm. Kind of have to scoot up a little bit. And the hair today just does not want to stay out of the face. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and maybe we should have skipped those druid levels after all. <laughs> but, okay, doors, so many doors. We don't want to use it again. Uh, first up we get wild shape, all druids get, get wild shape, let it, 